The Lord be with you. Also with you. Good morning and a very warm welcome to all. A special welcome to our guests and visitors joining us today, both here in person and on our live stream. Glad to have you join us. It is good to gather together as God's people in worship today. My name is Glenn Schleck. I'm the senior pastor here at Emmanuel. And for those of you here in person, you should have in your hand the bulletin for today. As I mentioned last week, there are some things that are changing slightly, and that includes what you get handed when you walk in in the morning, in, uh, into worship. And so what you got is on the front cover of that is a short kind of welcome information. On the inside are the outlines of both the 8 o'clock and the 1030 service. And on the back are all those who are participating, in case you are wondering who some of these folks are up front. So, I want to mention again my great appreciation for your flexibility as we continue changing and adjusting and morphing and uh, trying to figure out life and ministry together. And uh, as far as this morning goes, there really should not be a, a whole lot out of the ordinary for our 1030 service. But with the little things that are, I want to encourage you to just roll with it for a couple of weeks. We're going to try these some of these changes out for a month or so. And as always, you are welcome to offer your feedback, your thoughts, your input on what you're hearing and seeing. But like I said, my encouragement is, first of all, roll with some of the changes, roll with some of the adjustments, try them on, and see how they feel. Now, this morning we are continuing our new fall series that we started last Sunday, which is Forget Google, Ask God. And we're having a little fun at Google's expense through this fall in that regard. But I've got to give Google a little bit of credit as far as this morning goes. So earlier this week, as I'm getting ready for my sermon, I, I asked Google my sermon title. I said, okay, Google, how many times do I have to forgive someone? And it directed me right back to today's gospel reading that I was preaching on. Matthew 18. So I thought, okay, all right, I got to do a little informal survey here. Because is that just my personal algorithms at work and because where I'm tended to go as far as the Bible and all that? So I reached out to eight different people out of state, in state, different areas, different approaches to life. And guess what? They Googled, same question. And it all came back. The top response, Matthew 18, right where we're here today. So, nicely done, Google. <laughs> nicely done. So, with that in mind, and we're thinking today about forgiveness, the heart of the gospel, the challenges that come with it, but the importance of this amazing gift of God's grace. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we gather for worship, we come to you today with a sense of awe and wonder, also with anticipation, as we come to you eager to hear from you in your word again today. So, in that confidence, we put ourselves and our time together now into your hands, praying that you would indeed bless us, as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And I invite all for able to please stand and join our gathering songs. Good morning. Will you please join me in responding with Psalm 135? Give praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing, sing to him. Sing, sing, praise sing praise to him. Tell of all his wondrous acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look, Look to the Lord in his strength. Seek, seek his face always. Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles and the judgments he has pronounced. You, you his, his servants, servants, the descendants of Abraham, his chosen ones, the children of Jacob. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever, the promise he made for a thousand generations.
begin with those words of invocation that take us back to baptism and the myriad of promises God makes to us there. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father, first in the quiet of our hearts, and then together in the spoken confession. Merciful and gracious God, we confess our sin to you. We confess how easy it is for us to begin to adopt the attitudes and actions of the world around us, to let our lives be shaped by contemporary culture rather than by your call. Forgive us. We confess how often we think of our own interests first, more concerned with our own status and well-being than with the well-being of others. Forgive us. We confess that we do not always acknowledge you as Lord, trusting in our own abilities and following our own wills, rather than submitting ourselves to your will and your call. Forgive us. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray that our Lord would transform us, change us from the inside out so that our words and our lives would bring honor and glory to him, our Savior and Lord. By the same power that brought Jesus back from the dead, he assures us that our sin has been paid for and we are forgiven. As a called and ordained servant of the word, I proclaim to you today that reality, that our sins are forgiven in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated as we hear God's word. The Old Testament reading is from Ezekiel 33, verses 7 through 11. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the people of Israel. So hear the word I speak, and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you wicked person, you will surely die, and you do not speak out to dissuade them from their ways, that person will die for their sin, and I will hold you accountable for their blood. But if you do warn the wicked person to turn from their ways, and they do not do so, they will die for their sin, though you yourself will be saved. Son of man, Say to the Israelites, this is what you are saying. Our offenses and sins weigh us down, and we are wasting away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading is from Romans chapter 14. Accept the one whose faith is weak, without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants, servants stand or fall, and they will stand for the Lord. And they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special 
that is so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat, that is so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains, does so to the Lord, and give thanks to God. For none of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life, so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will acknowledge God. So then, each of us will live in account of ourselves to God. This is the word of the Lord. Praise and the Gospel reading for this morning is from Matthew 18, verses 21 to 35. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And he began the, set the settlement. A man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this time, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him and let him go. But that, when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me, and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what happened, they were outraged, and they went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all your debt because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. This is how my he heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the gospel of the Lord. For the children's message, I invite the children to come on forward. We've got the dots laid out here, spread out in front. So kids, come on up. And if there are any parents or others, adults that want to join, you're welcome. Now Jesus 
guy, not to make Ms. Martha confused, but because he's talking about forgiveness. Peter wanted to know, is there a certain number? If someone really bothers me, is there a certain number of times I'm supposed to forgive them? And Jesus says no. And the thing is, we are called to forgive one another, and even though it's sometimes really hard to forgive one another, we don't do it so that we can say, oh, I'm so great and kind and wonderful, I always forgive, I'm such a good person. But because God has forgiven us, and in our response to God's love, we are called to forgive one another, and when we forgive one another, we share God's love. Now, it's not always easy to forgive, and that's why we have to ask God sometimes for help. Because as humans, sometimes we just really don't want to forgive one another. So let's pray and thank God, one, that he forgives us, but two, that he would help us to forgive others. So everyone, big kids and little kids, you can repeat after me. Dear God, Dear God thank, you so thank you so much for always forgiving us. For always forgiving us. Help, us help us to be able to, be able to, forgive, others. to forgive others. Amen. Amen. All right, you can go sit back down. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Martha. Forgiveness. Easy peasy, right? All we have to do is say, I'm sorry, and I forgive you, and everything's great, right? What makes this business of forgiveness? Something that, that really does seem like it should be so easy. What makes it so hard? Because forgiveness is a significant piece right in the heart of the gospel message. Of why Jesus came and what our God is all about. I'm going to ask you to ponder on this for a few moments. I want you to think about what makes forgiveness so hard. And you can think about that, or if you're comfortable talking with those in close proximity to you, you are welcome to do that. So take a moment, if you would. So tell me, what are some of the things that make forgiveness so hard? Brian? You don't want them to feel like it's okay what they did. Okay, you don't want them to feel like it's okay what they did. If you forgive them, they, may, they might just not think anything of it. So keep it serious. Why else? Just forgive the sword. Stacy. Yeah, that repeat offender kind of a thing. You, they ask for forgiveness, you forgive, then they do it again, and you forgive, then they do it again, and it's like, okay, come on here. It's hard. It's hard to do that, isn't it? Susan? When what, they, what they're doing is, seems like it's destroying the other person's life. When what they're doing seems like it's destroying that other person or those other people's lives. Rachel. Yeah. I mean, it's simple, right? I mean, sometimes you are just so mad. It's hard to just say, what do you mean forgive? 
Priya. Sometimes you want to get that revenge and make the other person hurt as much as they made you hurt. Yeah, sometimes that revenge you think is going to feel pretty good. You want it. You want them to hurt to kill. And deep down inside myself, I have this illusion that I should never be inconvenienced, never cross, never question. They shouldn't be doing that to me. Yeah, in our minds, we're thinking, well, I should never be inconvenienced. I should never be hurt. I should never be put out or the object of something bad. I don't deserve that. That's not me. It, Judy? Uh, we've been hurt, so it's all about emotions that come out through that. Okay, we've been hurt, and it's about emotions. I, you, you can't get away from that. I mean, we feel that's part of how God made us. We're feeling emotional human beings. Forgiveness is hard. It is really hard. Now, with the story that Jesus told here today, that Martha so beautifully reenacted for us, <laughs> God seems pretty harsh, doesn't he? And I'm not going to go through it all again, but you've got the king who forgives this huge debt of a servant, then that servant doesn't forgive the smaller debt of a fellow servant, so the king throws that unmerciful servant into prison. But then the harsh part comes the way Jesus concludes the parable, the story. Listen to this again. He said, this is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from the heart. Whoa. I thought God was a, a loving God. I thought he was a warm, fuzzy kind of guy. Not mean like this. Well, speaking of harsh, did you catch the very first reading, the Old Testament reading in Ezekiel? Not the very first verse, but the second verse that Stacy read. Listen to this again. This is God speaking. Think harsh. God said, when I say to the wicked, you wicked person, you will surely die. And you do not speak out to dissuade them from their ways. That wicked person will die for their sin. And I will hold you accountable for their blood. Wow. And all this started from a, from a question. Question that Peter asked of Jesus when he said, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Now, we're not sure what prompted Peter to ask the question. We don't know if this is something personal for Peter, something that he was grappling with inside himself, or if it was something that maybe he and the other disciples had witnessed going on and some injustice they had seen or maybe it was something the disciples themselves were talking about and as Peter always was kind of the, the voice for the disciples he was the one that asked the question but regardless he asked this important question about forgiveness Lord how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me up to seven times a couple things with Peter's question. First of all, the response that he gave, the suggested answer that Peter came up with to his own question, it was actually pretty generous. Because you go back and the letter of the law was this, that you're supposed to forgive someone up to three times if they sin against you for the same offense. Three times, that was the law. That's what you were supposed to do. So Peter more than doubled it. And so he was probably feeling pretty good about his, his suggestion to Jesus. 
as far as the number of times we're supposed to forgive. Well, the other thing about his question, in the translation that we have here today that Stacy read, it almost sounds a little soft. Because really what Peter was asking was this, Lord, how many times do I have to forgive someone? How many times do I have to forgive before I can finally say, forget it, done with you, kick back, punch back, pay back? How many times before I can finally take it out? Jesus' response to Peter, he was playing a little numbers game. He took Peter's suggested response and he went with it. Jesus said not seven times, but 77 times, or it could be translated actually not seven times, but 70 times seven. So playing numbers game, what Jesus, in essence, was saying is you just keep forgiving far beyond what you could possibly ever keep track of. And then forgive again. And again. And again. Where it gets hard. Some of the responses you guys gave, and I imagine a few others that you're talking about. It's hard. What do you do when someone hurts you, sins against you, and they do it again, and again, and again, and there is no inclination that you are seeing that they are ever going to change? Or what about when a child is violated or a vulnerable person is taken advantage of? What about when a person in a position of trust or authority abuses that? What about those circumstances where that hurt creates a scar that alters the course of your life or others. And that scar never goes away. What about an instance to the extreme where there is no turning back, there's no coming back from it, specifically where somebody is killed? Forgiveness? It is not to be a doormat. It is not to excuse all behavior and to let everything go, to be walked on. That's not forgiving. That's not what Jesus is talking about. How many of you have either read the book or seen the movie The Shack? Any of you? Okay, a good number of you. The, the synopsis of it is, the short of it is, if you have not, there's a dad, his name is Mac, who was struggling mightily with the issue of his youngest daughter being abducted and being killed. This little girl of five, six, seven years old was stolen from him and murdered. Then, out of the blue, Mac gets a mysterious and personal invitation to meet God and to meet God at the shack at the place where it turns out his daughter was killed the scene we're going to watch which is near the end of the movie is Mac who's a young man is talking with God portrayed here as an old man about the need Mac has to forgive his daughter's killer. 
watch and listen carefully to this very short but very poignant conversation about God and forgiveness. See, you, you just let him get away with it. Nobody gets away with anything. Everything bears consequences. What he did was horrible. I'm not asking you to excuse what he did. I'm asking you to trust me to do what's right and to know what's best. And then what? Forgiveness doesn't establish a relationship. It's just about letting go of each throat. Mac, the pain inside is devouring you, robbing you of joy, quickening your capacity to love. I can't. You're not stuck because you can't. You're stuck because you won't. Did you hear those words? Nobody gets away with anything. Everything bears consequences. What he did was horrible. I'm not asking you to excuse what he did. I'm asking you to trust me to do what is right and to do what is best. Forgiveness doesn't establish a relationship. It's just about letting go of his throat. The pain inside is devouring you, robbing you of joy, crippling your capacity to love. Where else can we go biblically? Jesus said, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. We pray every week. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. On the cross, Jesus cried out, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. More often than not, forgiveness is not about the person who's hurt us. More often than not, forgiveness is about me. For Mac, for Mac it was letting go of his daughter's killer's throat. For us, it may be not allowing whatever that hurt may be to rule our lives, to dictate our actions, or to dominate our thinking. How many of you have heard the phrase, forgive and forget? Can't do it. Cannot do it. God can. God can forgive and forget, but humanly speaking, it is impossible for us. Now, the gist of it, there's some truth to it. And the gist of it is to not let whatever that hurt is be this large boulder that's sitting right on the path in front of me. But it is about moving that hurt further and further to the critical. Now, our natural reaction, you express some of that. But somebody hurts me, what's our gut reaction? I hurt them back. I'm going to kick them. I'm going to fight back. I'm going to get even. There's going to be payback. Hey, eye for an eye, and tooth for a tooth. That's biblical, right? Uh, that's not exactly what Jesus was talking about here. He went a different direction with that. So back to where we started. Let's circle back to the start and how harsh God seems with the story that Jesus told and with what we heard expressed in Ezekiel. He seems pretty harsh. And why? He's harsh because he knows that everything rises and falls on forgiveness. Forgiveness.
forgiveness is the very reason that Jesus came. It is the very heart of the message of the gospel. A message of grace, love, and forgiveness. It's a matter of literally life and death. To say, in essence, Jesus said, do you want to really live and to really enjoy what this life is that I've given to you? Or do you want to live your life in a prison of harboring bitterness and anger and a dark cloud continuously hanging over your head? Do you want to seek revenge? Do you want to live forever as the victim? Is that going to be your identity? Versus being a child of God who is loved and redeemed and forgiven and free. And we under, and need to understand what the Lord wants here. Going back to Ezekiel, started out by saying, I'm holding you accountable. But where did it end? Listen to this in verse 11, the very last verse in today's reading. Again, God speaking. So it's say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. That's what God wants. He wants life. He wants us to experience life as he intended it, to its absolute fullness. In our clip, the God figure there expressed it so well, talking back, saying that, you know, holding on to grudges, being unwilling to forgive, said all of this devours us. It robs us of joy, cripples our capacity to love. But when we're able to forgive, or even to be able to start taking small steps toward forgiveness, everything changes. There is real power in forgiveness. And that is what our Lord desires for us to experience. Life is so much better. So much better as we start experiencing not looking over our shoulder, not looking how we can get back, not looking how we can help someone else feel the pain that they inflicted on me, but instead to be able to live freely, looking for, Lord, what next? Where do you want me to be? Where do you want me to go? How is it that you are asking me to shine your light in the darkness of this world? That freedom comes. Joy starts to return. And a sense of peace, it begins to be real. Now we start every worship service with a time of confession and forgiveness. And that is very intentional very deliberate, because even as we gather in worship, it provides us that opportunity to reflect on and to acknowledge before God, before our King, our huge debt, all of our sin, and to acknowledge before one another that there is not one of us here who's got it all together. We struggle. All of us, in different ways, big and small. But to start in that way brings us back to be able to hear again of God's love, of our Savior's willingness to come into this world, take on our humanity, give up his own life sacrificially in a horrific death on the cross, and to rise again new life in the grave 
saying, this, this is what I give to you. This big debt you owe me, forgive it. Forgive it. Go on your way. Live life with that freedom that it's gone and the load has been lifted. We have the opportunity then to continue in our time of worship, to really worship God with that sense of joy, to be able to hear God's word for what he's saying to me, and then to walk out these doors and to be able to put that grace and that love and that forgiveness into action as we forgive the small debts that others owe us, releasing them to experience that same freedom that same grace, that same joy that God has given to us. We can live as changed people, transformed by the power of God's love, and redeemed to live this life with joy. The what now for today? I'm going to put you to work, or I invite you to go to work, to bring a home insert that's in your bulletin. Two things. First of all, encouraging you to start each day this week remembering the full and complete forgiveness that your Savior has won for you. It's real and it's yours. And then secondly, is there forgiveness that you are needing to offer someone else? Pray for that person or those people and ask for the Lord's help in taking some steps, big or small, toward offering that forgiveness. And we do it for the sake of freedom. We do it for the sake of our Lord, his victory and ours, and the life that we have been blessed to live in. Amen. That peace of God, a peace that at times goes beyond our understanding, let it guard our hearts and our minds through faith in Christ Jesus, to do the hard things, to experience the amazing grace that our Lord has given, and to live life as his people now, for all eternity. Amen. Amen. As we worship God through our offerings, given here in the baskets today or online, I invite you to join me in reiterating some of these amazing promises of our God. Friends of Christ, we know that all we have, all we are, and all we do is a gift from God. It is not served by human hands, as in the beginning, rather than being himself, it is everyone life and breath and everything else. God does not need our gifts, but he knows that life is better when we share generously from all that we have of our time, talents, and treasures. give our offerings a tenth or so. We are giving thanks to God for his abundant gifts to us. Lord God, as we return back to you what you have so generously given us, we do so, giving you all honor, praise, and glory. Amen. For the prayers today, we want to remember these specific requests that have come in. An anonymous request, a prayer for an individual whose cancer has returned, for Diane Pascal's uncle in Iowa dealing with pneumonia and an upcoming surgery, for the Clarkson family who are missionaries in Somaliland and are stateside for the next couple of months. Their young child is facing a two and a half hour heart surgery coming up on October 5th. For Donna Reese who is having another surgery later this week on the 23rd, for Patrick and Don Grimes, uh, Patrick is one of our drummers here for our 1030 service. They were in a car accident yesterday, uh, not seriously injured, but uh, pretty banged up. So praying for their healing and thanks that it wasn't more serious. For Shiloh Hatcher's mom in Omaha, she was diagnosed with COVID Thursday night. 
and due to her high risk status has been hospitalized. For Jean Buchanan, who's been diagnosed with a very rare neurological issue, she's been hospitalized for much of the week. For Lauren Miller, continued prayers for healing following her accident and surgery. For Chrissy Klein's mom and stepdad as they continue to deal with some very challenging medical and health related issues with her stepdad. For Sharon Tuxorn and her family with her mother's funeral this past Wednesday in Greeley. For Leslie Husenfeld and Colette Real at the death of their uncle Merlin who passed away on Monday. Prayers of thanks with Jackie Diener on her successful shoulder surgery on Monday. For Joe Sarr's sister Julie who received some relatively good news following her test results and her ongoing battle with cancer. For Kim Plachet and David Westfall, prayers of thanks for their fifth wedding anniversary this past Friday. Also on Friday, prayers of thanks for Elizabeth and Jason Atkins, who celebrated their 11th anniversary. We pray for our ministries here and for the world at large with all the natural disasters, the man-made disasters. And uh, at the news this Friday, uh, praying for the family of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg at her death, and also in light of that, praying for our country and as decisions are needing to be made as far as filling that spot. So let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Father in heaven, we come to you, a God of grace, a God of mercy, a God who is serious about sin, its consequences, and grace and forgiveness. Lord, we thank you that as our King, you forgive us our heavy load, our heavy debt. Help us to appreciate that and live in the freedom that you give to us. Lord, help us to be forgiving people who demonstrated that love in the day-to-day -day of our lives. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, we lay before you many needs. And I know that there are many more that we've carried into the sanctuary on our hearts and minds today. So we pray for all these, named and unnamed. You know the needs. And we trust you to help. To help as you are able. For the joys and celebrations in life, we give you thanks, knowing that, that these flow from your hand as well. Thank you for being God who is in the very midst of all that we are. And who desires to continue to walk with us every step of the way. Lord, in your mercy. For our ministries here, Emmanuel, we give you thanks for so many opportunities we have. Opportunities to grow in you, to worship you, to serve you. And Lord, I pray with all of our education classes uh, up and running, and in-person worship happening, we pray that you would continue to let your grace abound continue to work through your word to, tra to transform us and shape us into the people you would have us be. We continue to pray for our school ministry, for enrollment there, for the kids and teachers. We pray for health, safety, and well-being. Lord, help us in all that we are and all that we do to be shining lights in this community and beyond. Lord, in your mercy. And for our world at large, there is so much that is going on. By way of natural disasters, between flooding and droughts, storms and fires. Lord, we pray for all those who have been impacted. And we pray for all the many relief workers and those who are still in the midst of fighting and relieving some of these tragic issues. And Lord, for the many man-made things that we seem to keep putting ourselves into. We pray for the family of Justice Ginsburg. We pray for your comfort and peace for them. We pray for our country as a whole, as polarized as we continue to be. We pray that you would bring us together. Don't know how, don't know when, but I pray, Lord, that you would bring healing where healing is needed. Help us to separate the divides. Help us build bridges. Help us to be extenders and receivers of your grace and forgiveness. Lord, help us. Be with President Trump and all of our leaders elected and appointed throughout our government and throughout the justice system. We 
pray for wisdom. And for all those in law enforcement, firefighters, and first responders, we give you thanks for their willingness to be in our communities, helping keep us safe. We pray for the men and women of our armed forces serving here and around the world. For all those who are willing to put themselves in harm's way for our safety and for our freedoms, we give you thanks. We pray for their safety and for their protection. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now, as you know, here at Emmanuel, we have started once again celebrating the Lord's Supper as a part of each Sunday service. And we do that not as a simple church ritual, not simply because we have to, because it's the church thing to do. But we celebrate the Lord's Supper because it is the very power of God that brings God's forgiveness to bear on our lives and strengthens and empowers us to walk out these doors and live the lives we've been called to live. Our Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, after supper, he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and he said, Drink of this, all of you. This is my blood, blood of the new covenant, that is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we do. We come to receive these gifts of God. In some sense, mystery, and in some sense, comfort. Now, if there are any of you here today wondering whether or not you should come receive the Lord's Supper, would you ask yourself these four questions? First, do you believe in Jesus? Do you know him as Lord and Savior? Secondly, do you acknowledge the sin in your own life and desire the forgiveness that our Lord offers through this gift? Third, do you believe Jesus' words when he tells us that what we receive today, it's not just bread and wine. It goes far beyond that. That is also the very body and blood of Jesus, in, with, and under these simple elements. And finally, fourth would be your intention of the Holy Spirit working in your heart and in your life, that you would seek to live each day, extending that grace, living in that freedom. If you answered yes to those questions, this gift is for you. We have our two serving stations, one on either side of the sanctuary. I encourage you to follow the direction of the ushers as they direct you as to where you need to go. A couple things during these days. I'm going to ask that you wear your mask as you make your way to communion. You can take it off, obviously, when you get to the serving station to be able to take the bread and the wine. We'll also ask that you physically distance your family units about six feet or so and respect those around you with that distance. After receiving the bread and wine, the body and blood of our Lord, you're welcome to come to the communion rail anywhere along here to spend some time in prayer. I would simply ask that you not kneel down or touch the communion rail, that you would simply stand here at the communion rail for prayer before returning to your seats. And as we commune together, we're in spirit songs as they'll lead us in song, singing, celebrating, remembering the powerful gift. God's grace and love for us. So my friends, come to the table. He's ready.
what these gifts of God, gifts poured out with love and grace. Let them be an encouragement, a strength, a power of life for you. As we walk out these doors filled with grace, love, and forgiveness from our Savior, we'll be able to share with those around us. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. Lord, look on you with favor and give you this peace. My days are gone. again for joining together in worship. I pray that uh, talking about this critical matter of our faith when it comes to forgiveness, I pray that it is and will continue to be a freeing gift as you step through this week ahead. As far as ministry highlights, our educational hour is fully functional as of today. If you missed it, I encourage you to come next week. It starts at 9.30 with uh, all of the different adult classes for kids. This is week two, they've been in, and uh, things are rolling quite well for them. Now middle schoolers, high schoolers, and adults, lots of different opportunities to be in study of God's Word. If you would like to hear more about those, you can find those in my updates or on our website. If you do not currently get my updates that I send out by email a couple of times a week, We've got cards on the coffee cart that you can fill out. Uh, check a box for what you'd like to receive, which also includes being on our prayer ministry. And uh, let us know, and we'll get you added and included on those various aspects of the ministry. And as always, you can stay connected, not only through my email updates, but through our website, through our manual app, and through our YouTube channel. So. For next week, we will continue this fall series, Forget Google, Ask God, and we'll be asking this question. Okay, Google, tell me what's fair as we look at equity and fairness from God's standpoint. With that, go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks. 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 Thanks.